Yeah, welcome everybody um, to today's virtual ethical uh, innovation lecture, or VEIL in short, as we call it. Um, so we developed or we, we kind of initiated this lecture series as, as a way to spread the word about interesting initiatives or ideas, spark debate, and mostly focused on the ethical and societal aspects of technology. Um, have bite-sized inputs on that and then some room for discussion despite uh, the pandemic and making good use of the online format. Um, we are all very happy to have you here and uh, have this fit in your busy schedule. Uh, it's also designed that way that it's, uh, it's not supposed to be a lunch seminar, but it's supposed to be fitting in kind of neatly uh, into what you do otherwise and also engage uh, one or two people here that are not familiar with um, the ethics of technology or not look at this so often to actually get a glimpse about very interesting ideas. And um, we are happy that um, that you took the time to join us today. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude um, to the Academy of Humanities and Science in Hamburg, which supports this lecture series with some funding. So many thanks for that. And um, before we continue with uh, our today's talk, let me briefly explain or say a few words about us. We are the Ethical Innovation Hub, which is a research group that is uh, kind of a joint venture between the Institute for Electrical Engineering and Medicine and the Institute for the History of Medicine and Science Studies. So an institute that is in the technological science and one that is in the humanities and um, Jointly, we do research together on how ethical considerations can be used as a driver for innovation in technology development processes um, and the ethical implications um, basically aimed at building better technology um, for the future. Our today's speaker, Rob Sparrow, is a professor of philosophy at Monash University. Um, Australia. His interests are political philosophy and applied ethics mostly. Um, from his website, we could see that um, uh, it is stated that he often deals with the uncomfortable real world ethical implications of adopting new technologies. And that's that fits right in what, what we are interested in. So we are very glad to have you here from the other side of the globe. So you are the speaker that has been as far as farthest away from where we are located, but well, virtual meetings make this all possible. And um, now we are at about five past two, you're about five past 10 p.m. So there's a slight shift of 10 hours in between our places, but um, this this time seemed to suit well. So thanks for that, thanks, thanks for making this possible. Um, and today we'll talk, uh, a brief note uh, about one virtual ethical innovation lecture that we had to skip. We are sorry about that, but we had to reschedule. So that's what this slide is for. Aiden Pepin from the Ada Lovelace Institute will be talking in October. So we shifted his talk into the winter term, um, but still looking forward to his talk on the datafication and the boundaries of health. So stay tuned for that. And also stay tuned for the new program of the virtual ethical innovation lecture, which you can not yet see online, but soon we'll let you know. So today, Rob Sparrow will talk about high hopes for deep medicine, medicine, AI economics, and the future of care. And we would like uh, you to first listen to his presentation in full. And um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A window um, to tell us so. We'll um, take care of these. And I try to have a good look at what has been asked and then uh, later on moderate questions and answers. You are now all participants, attendees to this uh, WebEx meetings framework. That means you cannot unmute yourself. But if you use the app, um, once the presentation is finished, I will all promote you to panelists. And then you can also ask your questions using your own microphone. And we'll kind of have a real discussion. That, that would be nice if you, if you prefer to do this. If you don't, then I'll just read out the questions from the Q&A window. So without further ado, um, please, Rob, we're looking forward to your presentation. Mute myself and you can take over the screen. Thanks, Christian, and thank you all for um, spending the time uh, here today. Um, 
Okay, and now I can uh, present. Uh, I wouldn't normally actually use uh, PowerPoint for a, um, a presentation of this nature, uh, but I did want to have some quotes in this uh, talk. So uh, I have got, um, got slides uh, today. Uh, so I should begin by saying that this is based on published work. I'm hoping that I might extend a bit beyond the published work uh, today, but there is actually a paper, a co-authored paper with a graduate student of mine, Mr. Joshua Hatherley, uh, which came out in the um, Hastings Centre uh, report uh, last year. And the paper was, um, uh, I guess the inspiration for the paper was the thought that um, a lot of the claims being made about the potential for AI in healthcare seem to me uh, naive about the economics of the setting and naive about some um, uh, questions in the philosophy of technology and organisational um, psychology or the way organisations work that suggest that perhaps these technologies won't be taken up uh, in the way that people uh, are hoping. Uh, so it is a, um, uh, it's a slightly deflationary paper in relation to AI in medicine. And I do want to um, express uh, my enthusiasm for applications of AI uh, in medicine. It's not, it's not that I think there's no role for AI in medicine. Um, it's that I'm worried that the social context in which these technologies are being developed and are likely to be deployed uh, means that they their potential will not be fully realised. Um, so it's not a Luddite talk um, by any uh, means, but it is a critical uh, talk. Uh, now for sort of pragmatic purposes, the criticism is um, we've used uh, Eric Topol in this uh, very influential book, Deep Medicine, uh, at, to focus the critique. Um, so in some ways, this is a response to Topol. Uh, but again, I think it's worth emphasizing that Topol is representative of a broader uh, uh, strand of opinion uh, that are holding that uh, AI has this emancipatory potential when it comes to the relationship between uh, physicians and patients that the, the best way to understand uh, the impact of AI in medicine is not as replacing physicians, but enhancing them and enhancing in particular their capacity to uh, engage in meaningful human relationships with those who they are caring for. And for re various reasons I'll discuss in a moment, uh, that's quite a popular position uh, in this literature to say, look, this stuff isn't going to replace human doctors. Uh, what it's going to do is free them to spend time uh, with their patients. And it's that claim uh, in particular uh, that we wanted to uh, uh, criticize. Uh, so here's um, here's a quote from uh, Topol, which is just, I mean, it's part of the setup to say, look, um, there's this, uh, the deep in deep medicine is this idea of sort of data mining the patient, data mining their genome, looking at their social context, using all the data that we can increasingly um, bring to bear on healthcare and really diving down into it using, uh, using AI. And that this is going to have um, improved medical uh, diagnosis in the practice of medicine. Uh, now I've got an image of a pie in the sky uh, there, and that's because I want to recognize that the promise of medical AI, uh, despite all the enthusiasm about it, is still very much uh, a promise. Uh, that even as these technologies are being rolled out, uh, the evidence base that shows them to be superior uh, to human judgment is actually pretty thin. And so some of you might be aware of uh, this uh, 
the meta-analysis in the um, Lancet Digital Health that came out uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that was uh, looking at all the claims that had been made about um, the performance of um, uh, of AI, in particular deep learning, um, in this context in medical imaging. And what was really striking, people read this paper in very different ways. Uh, you know, you can be an optimist or a pessimist uh, about the outcome. But what was striking uh, to me, or what I, I thought was interesting, is that they describe looking um, at 31,000 studies and ending up uh, with uh, 25, st uh, 25 studies that did out of sample uh, validation and only 14 of those studies um, looked at um, uh, a direct comparison uh, between these deep learning models and the healthcare professionals. And, and, and just that, the extent of that um, <laughs> contraction uh, is really quite uh, striking. Now, if you push harder on this kind of, uh, on this literature and you want to see uh, data on performance in the wild, like when these things are actually rolled out in the clinic and you want good long-term you know, longitudinal data uh, comparing the performance of AI systems or machine learning systems and human physicians, there's really very little there. Now, that being said, it doesn't seem at all unlikely to me uh, that machines will outperform human beings uh, in various roles. Indeed, that seems machines outperform human beings in all sorts of things already, uh, and I have no doubt that they will outperform human beings uh, in lots of medical contexts. Uh, I just want to remind people uh, that we're still at a stage where we are considering uh, a technology that uh, remains in the future. Uh, now, one of the other thing, one of the things that is also um, strange about this claim about the superiority of AI uh, relative to human performance in medicine uh, is the unwillingness of people to draw what seems to me the obvious conclusion, uh, which is that um, human beings shouldn't be performing in those roles uh, if, um, if the machines are really better. Uh, so one of the things that's, I guess, striking about the literature on AI in medicine is everybody sells these technologies as assistants. Uh, but in some ways, I think they have to be seen as replacements, uh, not for the full package of human care, but for the tasks at which the machines uh, are genuinely better. That if someone can show uh, robust data uh, that a machine is outperforming a human physician in a particular role, uh, seems to me follow very quickly that we shouldn't have human beings uh, doing that uh, anymore. Uh, and, and you can imagine um, in a situation that's well short of that, where there's just a suspicion, where, where there's you've got near peer performance, you can imagine people uh, feeling as though they need to at least check in with the machine or defer to the machine uh, because they are worried uh, about trusting their own judgment and then someone suing them and saying, look, why didn't you consult uh, uh, consult the AI. Uh, so there are some, uh, there's an obvious worry here, which is not just the sort of the traditional machines are coming to take our jobs, but in the context of medical ethics, uh, there's actually a moral imperative to replace human beings wherever uh, they perform worse than uh, machines. Uh, now, Topol is very conscious of this, I mean, I guess because everyone's worried about machines coming to take their jobs. Uh, so Topol uh, makes uh, this move where he says, look, it's not that they are going to um, uh, eliminate human physicians, and indeed it's not even that they will do better than human physicians, uh, human physicians is that you will 
end up practicing, practicing medicine uh, in partnership with AI and that uh, as a result of having that AI tool, you'll be able to spend more time uh, with your patients. You'll spend more time doing the in the caring role, doing the things that in some sense patients uh, want from their physicians. They want time and uh, meaningful relationships. I mean, they also want their cancer to be well diagnosed uh, as well and the um, treatments to work. Uh, but there is this um, sense, interestingly, it's self-driven by the impact of electronic health records, uh, that medicine has moved away from its um, kind of humanist, from being a humanistic practice to being a technocratic practice, and that's been to the detriment uh, of the care. And so um, Topol wants to say, look, AI is going to put a stop to that, and that's why we should uh, embrace uh, deep medicine. Now, if I can just, um, you know, play the role of a cynic or a skeptic for a moment, um, this is precisely what you have to say if you are selling this technology at the moment. If, if you want to come into a medical conference and tout your AI, you can't say to the people that you are hoping will buy this technology uh, that it will put them out of work. Uh, so there's a rhetorical necessity of making a move like this. Uh, this claim is precisely what you would expect as uh, entrepreneurs and manufacturers were trying, trying to bring this technology online. Uh, they wouldn't say, look, you should adopt this machine because it'll put you out of work. What they will say is it will make your job uh, more rewarding. Now, of course, that, that people have that motive doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the claim isn't true. Um, the danger here is, you know, the traditional da danger with ad hominem arguments. They might ad hominem criticism. The claim might still be true, but it is worth pointing out that we would expect this is precisely what you would expect uh, people to say. Uh, now, I mean, this would be. I, I should say I would love it if this were true. You know, this is a, this is an attractive vision uh, for the future of um, AI enhanced medicine, uh, but it does seem to me profoundly naive about the institutional context in which medicine uh, is practiced. Uh, so, for a number of reasons, I actually think that what will happen if machines can save physicians' time is not that uh, physicians will. Um, be able to take that time and spend it talking meaningfully with their patients. Uh, but that time will be eaten by the institution and actually the time allowed for uh, consultation uh, will, be, um, will be shrunk. That instead of, being, instead of having variously, you know, 11 to seven minutes uh, with the doctor, you'll only get four uh, because the machine is allowing the doctor to do everything that much more uh, effectively. Uh, now, I think this is most obvious if, you're, if your healthcare setting uh, has for-profit healthcare, um, and this, uh, you imagine a, a for-profit institution bringing in a machine that can save time, uh, they aren't going to say, well, that's great, you know, talk meaningfully with your patient uh, in the time you're saved, uh, when, when they could put more patients through uh, through the system. Uh, even, you know, outside of uh, for-profit sector, um, there are very good reasons to want to expand access to healthcare. And if um, physicians, if AI is saving physicians time, uh, then you can put more patients through and that's great because you get more patients through the system. There's also an institutional dynamic here, which relates to um, the way in which organisations respond to things that they can easily measure. So patients per hour or, you know, number of surgeries per day is easily, easily measured and as a result of that easy uh, to uh, try to boost those numbers. Uh, meaningful caring relationships with your patients, even if you kind of do post uh, treatment surveys, it's really hard for that number to compete uh, with these other numbers related to um, 
uh, getting pe more people uh, through the system. Um, so, you know, if the machine is really uh, removing the need, one of the things that Topol imagines is that um, AI will just record all the interactions with the patient. Doctors won't have to write notes anymore. Uh, all the information that they'll need will just magically appear at their fingers, fingertips because the AI will have worked out what's required. You imagine these kind of digital medical assistant working really effectively. Uh, but the benefits of that, I think, are very unlikely uh, to be realised in terms of patient-physician contact, just for these very boring uh, institutional uh, reasons. Now, of course, Topol um, is a very clever man, uh, and there's no, um, he is not um, unaware of this, so he explicitly uh, mentions the possibility that um, these technologies can be used just to kind of squeeze uh, squeeze more performance uh, out of out of doctors. And his response is to call for uh, political activism from the medical profession to contest this future and to contest what happens to the time that is saved by AI, uh, to insist that be invested in making uh, medicine a more rewarding uh, profession uh, because people care about people, uh, and also uh, to invest in the care uh, that is granted uh, to patients. And in some ways, uh, I think Topol intended the book as a call to arms on this question. The book is actually quite a kind of um, slippery beast in some ways. He never really comes out and says this, feel, this um, future of more human contact will be realised. He says it might be realised, and it might be realised if um, the medical profession and patients uh, fight for it. Uh, now, at one level, I think that's exactly right. This, this technology, like any technology, uh, is up for grabs. Social contestation can make a difference to how a new technology uh, is used. Uh, and so people should be contesting what happens uh, to or with the, um, uh, the benefits uh, of AI. But I'm not optimistic uh, here. And again, this is a, maybe this is a matter of personal or political uh, temperament, but I think the historical record doesn't give much um, cause uh, for hope here. So Topol is expecting that um, physicians will take political action, will actually contest with their own institutions in a period that he himself says is a period of uh, in which we should expect massive disruption to the practice of medicine and to the medical profession. And if you know anything about the history of uh, politics, um, people win political victories when they're feeling confident and empowered. And it's very hard to imagine the medical profession feeling confident and empowered when everything is being tossed up in the air by this uh, remarkable uh, new uh, technology. Uh, moreover, it's a technology that, uh, where the, that generates a real fear of job losses. And when you're worried about your job, it's hard to go on strike. It's hard to put yourself on the line to uh, demand uh, that things are done differently for the sake of patient uh, care. Um, it's also hard when uh, what is happening uh, to the medical profession is um, what's happened to lots of skilled professions as automation begins to encroach, uh, which is that the bundle of skills is being carved up. Uh, you've got ever, ever more specialization and more and more of that um, uh, 
of that bundle of skills that's been disaggregated gets taken over uh, by uh, technology. Uh, so we can expect a, um, uh, and this sort of exacerbates the concerns about job losses, uh, we can expect physicians to be, um, you know, worried about how more and more of what they previously thought to be their core skills or functions are now being outsourced to machines or to human uh, machine uh, combinations. Uh, so in all sorts of ways, this strikes me as being a profoundly disempowering uh, experience for the medical uh, profession and precisely the wrong time to be expecting them to get out on the streets and contest uh, the uh, organisational power relations within the healthcare uh, sector. It's also worth mentioning that one of the actually, I mean, big data is always a surveillance, uh, always has potential for surveillance. And indeed, one of the first uh, things that's happening with medical AI is gathering data and tracking more and more aspects of physician uh, performance and the performance of um, others in the healthcare system. Now, in some ways, this is um, clearly a good thing. I mean, it depends a little bit on what the metrics are, but obviously iatrogenic harm is a real problem in the medical profession. Uh, big data, AI have real potential to reduce that uh, harm. But it's also, um, uh, again, fairly hard on people to expect that as they come under more and more uh, surveillance, as they find more and more of their professional life encroached on by these powerful AI systems, uh, to expect that they will unite and fight um, for increased patient, uh, patient care. So I'm a little bit more pessimistic than Topol uh, appears to be uh, when uh, he uh, suggests that what needs to be done is this kind of um, political activism. Uh, now, in fact, uh, Topol himself is uh, conscious that the historical record here is not great. So if you look at uh, the history of electronic medical uh, records. And, and I mean, people really should be looking at the introduction of just computers into the healthcare setting uh, for an important set of lessons about the impact, the likely impacts of uh, AI. Uh, and Topol takes a couple of pot shots at, um, at Epic, which is the manufacturer of um, one of the main uh, uh, health record systems that's used in the, in the US and says, look, um, this, and it's well known that the introduction of these technologies uh, has been catastrophic for the patient-physician relationship and for the, um, uh, the experience of being a physician. It's one of the main causes of physician burnout is a sense that one has become uh, a, a sort of data, a data entry uh, um, clerk, and that one is having to spend one's entire time, uh, you know, tracking down different small buttons to click on on web pages. These electronic health record systems uh, haven't realised their potential, uh, their full potential, well, their advertised potential uh, in the context of, of, of healthcare, and have been very um, disruptive of the physician experience. And people knew this. At the time, this was also a, a, a sort of a technology that was supposed to be contested. And as Topol points out, um, physicians didn't, at least in the US, they didn't win uh, that battle. So why you would expect them to win against, um, uh, in the context of AI, uh, you know, is really um, unclear. In fact, there's all sorts of reasons to think that the introduction of AI will uh, extend and exacerbate the dynamics that already have been introduced through uh, electronic health records. Um, so the worry here is that people will end up simply drowning in data. Uh, that um, uh, And particularly because 
it's data that drives AI. So when people introduce AI systems into medical settings, one of the first things they want to do is improve the system by gathering, uh, uh, gathering more data. And we also saw this with the healthcare records. When it became easier to record data, it wasn't that people recorded the same number of data points uh, and more quickly and moved on. The, um, the affordances of this technology meant that people were asked to record more and more. And that's precisely the dynamic that one would expect uh, when, it come, when it came to um, the use of AI in clinical, uh, in, in clinical contexts. But now, now Tobble again is aware of this uh, problem, and so he's very enthusiastic about the idea that um, one of the main settings for or main uses for AI in medicine should be precisely gathering this data. So he's imagining um, very sophisticated speech recognition systems, gait analysis, facial recognition, uh, automating the data collection process in order to save physicians from having to record uh, more and more. Um, and I, I guess I'm also skeptical about the impact of these uh, technologies other than, than uh, generating yet more data that physicians have to look over. So check that the um, speech recognition has accurately recorded uh, the conversations, check that the facial analysis doesn't reveal different patient emotions than those that the physician would have uh, would have claimed were present uh, in the interview. And part of the reason for scepticism here is an awareness that um, sensing the world, even with all the improvement in machine vision that we've seen over the last decade, uh, that old model where people thought that moving and sensing was easy and thinking and planning was hard uh, was the wrong way around. Now we realise that um, that sensing is a really hard problem. Uh, and, and so replacing one of the places that you think that um, uh, physicians might be least uh, vulnerable to replacement is actually in the kind of physical examination uh, of patients or, or this kind of um, forming an impression of the patient, which can be quite clinically valuable, uh, but very, very hard uh, to automate. Another worry here is that um, the process of um, recording data is sometimes, I mean, recording data in an interview with a patient uh, can sometimes just silent the, silence the patient. The patient just has to be quiet while the doctor types away. But sometimes the process of examination and, and um, gathering data is itself an opportunity for conversation and care. And if machines were actually capable of uh, capturing this kind of data, it might well be to the detriment uh, of other forms of data and to the detriment of the uh, patient's experience of care. To zoom out a bit and to um, look at some of the questions about black box AI and the impact of black box AI that I'm sure you're familiar with from other speakers uh, in this series. The claim that AI will improve the patient-physician relationship and will improve uh, the practice of care uh, is a really strange one in the context of um, worries about black box uh, medicine, because there's a, there's a relationship here between trust and care, and between care and a sense of um, uh, the agency of the physician. Now, the more that um, doctors are having to rely upon the functionings of algorithms that they don't understand, or maybe could, perhaps it couldn't understand, uh, the less authority they are likely to have in the eyes of the patient. And the less the 
uh, any discussions that do take place between the doctor and the patient about the patient's values are likely to be represented uh, in the results of the consultation. The intervention of an artifact that is inscrutable uh, to uh, both the doctor and the patient uh, strikes me as like being actually profoundly disruptive uh, to the patient-physician relationship, and in particular to the sense that uh, patients trust their doctors, excuse me, and, and feel care uh, feel cared for uh, by their doctors. Um, and any attempt to actually um, overcome this dynamic by, for instance, insisting on the ultimate responsibility of the doctor by demanding that the doctor looks over the outputs of the AI and the deliberations of the AI, uh, actually it seems highly likely to exacerbate um, the workload issues that I've identified or Josh and I identified earlier in this presentation that if you really want to free up the physician's time, you need to let the AI do more and more, but that makes it harder and harder for the patient to see the doctor as deeply involved in their care, or you want the patient to see the doctor taking care and looking over the AI, uh, the deliberations of the AI, in which case the workload uh, increases. So in short, the hope that um, AI is going to free up doctors uh, uh, to spend more time with their patients strikes me as being wishful thinking. It's a hope. Uh, it, it's not a promise. And uh, given the political difficulties uh, with contesting this future, uh, actually, it seems to me quite unlikely that that uh, technological potential will be realised, uh, which is, of course, a shame and does not deny the potential that AI has to improve healthcare in all sorts of other ways. I will leave it there and look forward to your questions. Mm -hmm.